Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 249 of the JavaScript Jabber Show. This week on our panel, we have Joe Eames. Hey, everybody. Amy Knight. Hey, everybody else. Uh, I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. Just a quick shout out about JS Remote Conf coming up in March. Um, we have two special guests this week. We have Jeff Cross. Hello. And Sam Sacconi. Hello, everyone. So uh, we brought you on today to talk about loading things. And it was funny because when Jeff said it the first time, I was like, I was like, no, what are we really talking about? Because I was <laughs> like, loading things, you know, you just put a script tag in and it loading things. And <laughs> apparently there's more to it than that. Do you want to kind of explain where we're coming from on this? Yeah, I'll let Sam do all the talking about this. Go ahead, Sam. <laughs> well, you know, uh, once you do window.onload, you can really get a sense for when your page is ready. So I think that's all we have to say, right? That's right. Uh, okay. So yeah, load, loading is a, it's a broad topic. Uh, it's something that Sam and I both have uh, a lot of interest in. And we see a lot of projects and we see a lot of things happening to improve how things get loaded in pages. And so... Uh, so I think it's a good time to talk about how things have evolved and, and what's going on with how people get scripts into pages these days and how they load style sheets and you know all the wrong ways that they're doing things and, and how they could improve the performance and user experience with better loading. This episode is sponsored by Compose.io. Databases are arguably the most difficult part of the stack to manage. The last thing you want is to wake up at 4 a.m. because the database failed and you have no backups. Compose has all that covered for you, so rest assured that your database is fast, reliable, and always on. It's production-ready cloud databases on AWS and GCP for SoftLayer, so go check them out. You can pick from nine databases including MongoDB, Elasticsearch, Redis, RethinkDB, MySQL, and one of the latest, ScyllaDB, which is a fast drop-in replacement for Cassandra. All databases come with guaranteed RAM, IOPs, and CPU that auto-scale. Automatic daily and on-demand backups, high availability nodes, security you can count on with, with private VLAN, IP whitelisting, SSH and SSL, two-factor authentication, and much more. Deploy your database in minutes and they'll take care of all of the administrative tasks like patches and upgrades. Set up is fast and easy, so go try them out for 30 days free at compose.com slash devchat. So uh, I'm just going to kind of start this off because I've got some questions about this. It seems like uh, when I first started doing web development, we would just load in, you know, 20 gazillion JavaScript files and CSS files and fonts and images. You know, you just put in a list, you know, and you'd have script tags for all of it. And then we got all these fancy build tools. And so now it minifies and uglifies and, uh, you know, cleans it up and makes it all into one file so that we have one system. And then we load that in. Are, are we still doing it wrong? Um, I, so I, I think it's a, one big thing that's changed with why loading is different now. Well, one is we keep adding more tools and more things and marketing teams want to add more scripts and pages and, and that kind of thing. But mobile is the biggest thing that's made developers have to get smart about how they load assets. Uh, so like on a mobile phone, obviously the, the computation power isn't isn't quite as good as desktop, even if you've got multiple cores. Uh, Alex Russell had that great talk at the Chrome Dev Summit where he talked about how really only one core gets used most of the time. And so the processing power is not as nice as we've kind of gotten spoiled with as developers. And also network and battery are things you have to contend with. Like firing up the network to make more requests kills the battery and, and also the data isn't quite as fast. So, so now as developers, we have to think more about targets for how quickly we want the the page to be uh, interactive or or even have content shown to the user and how loading things like scripts and style sheets and uh, other assets factors into that factors into blocking rendering or factors into even having data available to show to users yeah i think it's it's not the concept of we're doing things wrong now um but like the idea that as we progress in 2016, 2017, uh, we're adding more and more stuff. The, your tooling stack to build a website today is gigantic compared to what it was in 2011, 2010. Um, and that comes at a cost. We're, sh we're shipping way more code than we've ever been shipping. Um, and the browser has to turn that into, into code, into actually executable code. And that comes at a cost. So um, the trick I mean, the trick, in quotes, uh, of making a fast website today comes down to a lot of shipping less code and sending less code to your users, uh, which uh, 
the default tool set that most people are using today, uh, it just doesn't do that. It ships everything down or it does some minification, some tree shaking, but in almost every website that we look at today, uh, when we're doing sort of a performance deep dive, people are just shipping tons and tons of stuff that can be either deferred or not shipped at all. I think that's an interesting point to, to sh um, show Sam and I, we have a little bit different background. Sam doesn't believe in tools at all. He believes in just shipping the code you hand write down, right? No transpilation, no packing. Just, just beautiful handcrafted artisanal code. That's artisanal the only way to code. do it. No. Uh, <laughs> and, and I, obviously tools have a place. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, but I'm more the the other side where I, I work on Angular, uh, and we we try to solve these problems in in the framework way. Um, like Mike, we we have tooling that helps helps to bundle things up and and ship ship assets down as small as possible and as easily easy to parse as possible as little JavaScript as possible. Um, but also to do things like code splitting and other techniques that that we could talk about a little bit more. So the the first question I guess I have then is you mentioned minification and tree shaking, and I was thinking. Well, you know, I'm using the Angular CLI, with, which sets up Webpack to do the pipeline that does the minification and the tree shaking. So, you know, I do the head of, ahead of time compiling, and it takes all the stuff out that I'm not going to use. And so, genius me, I've already solved this. And then you're saying, yeah, but there are things that you can do beyond minification and tree shaking. And so, I'm, I'm trying to picture what that is. Uh, a, a good site that we actually looked at uh, a couple months ago, uh, do you remember code.gov came out uh -huh. uh, recently and they shipped a big Angular 2 application? Um, and uh, they were a little behind of where you say you are using ahead of time compilation. Uh, Jeff can go into more of the details that they, they had specifically, but basically they had the slow mode on by default, which is how Angular 2 ships today, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so uh, I'll let Jeff tell, sort of tell you that story, and we can go into the fixes that we went uh, we went and made after we turned on ahead of time compilation. Yeah, okay, hang on. A Amy's asking if we can back up. Yeah, in the phone. I just like you know I, w I would like to keep our discussion open to all levels. So can we go ahead and define that really quick? Which ahead of time compilation? Yes. yes. So we, yeah, we so go ahead without without getting like too deep into things. Well, yeah. essentially, it's I a process. <laughs> It's the process that uh, Angular allows you to go through. Uh, it does the minification and tree shaking, like we said, but in the end, it gives you uh, statically compiled, or anyway, it gives you a static file that doesn't have to run the um, compiler in the browser. And so it's, it's performance optimized and has a lot of other things going for it. That helps. We probably, I feel like most people know what tree shaking is by now, but we probably should go over that too. I'll let somebody else define that. Yeah, so, um, so, so Angular CLI, it has, uh, you're right, it does things, well, it actually, I think AOT is still not default, but yeah, like you said, AOT makes it where you take the compilation that would otherwise happen just in time in the browser, and you do it at build time, and that lets you, one, you save the computation of doing that compilation at uh, runtime in the browser. Uh, so you just do it once at build time, and then every user just gets something that runs much faster. Uh, the other benefit is you can take out a lot of Angular from w the bytes that actually get shipped to the browser. Uh, so that's that's ahead of time compilation by itself. Uh, tree shaking is something that um, isn't really part of AOT, but is part of CLI has some module level tree shaking built in to where if there are mod modules that are part of your um, your binary or bundle uh, that aren't used, you, you, like you don't actually import and uh, reference any symbols from those modules, those modules will get removed. Uh, there are different ways of tree shaking, like Closure Compiler has even deeper tree shaking than that, where, where it goes beyond modules and will actually take any symbol from within modules and will remove that if it's, if it's not referenced, but will keep other parts of the module. Um, um, I'm just going to chime in here. We did an episode on rollup.js, which mm -hmm. is built around the idea of tree shaking. So if you want a more in-depth discussion of what it is and why to do it, um, we'll put a link to that episode in the show notes as well so you can you know, get deeper knowledge if you're interested in it. Yeah, I'd like to hear your take on uh, the, effect of the effect efficacy of rollup versus the closure compiler. 
Um, I, I forget exactly. I forget if roll up does module level tree shaking or if it actually goes deeper. But it goes the, deeper. Yeah, it goes deeper. Yeah. So I was, I'm thinking the way, I'm thinking uh, that CLI doesn't use. Well, I, I shouldn't speak because I haven't really kept up with CLI. They weren't using roll up. They were using. They're not. They're not. Okay. So still not. Um, they're they're just using webpacks. Uh, yeah. The, the Angular CLI does not use roll up. <clears throat> so I think Rollup is a little bit more advanced than Webpacks. I'm not sure in what ways, um, but I think it does go deeper. Uh, Closure, uh, I'm not sure the, the difference exactly other than we get, uh, most of the time we measure it, we're able to get significantly smaller, like 30% smaller uh, bundles. But that's, we also, we have some tools that make Closure, we, like we can take TypeScript sources from Angular and generate Closure annotated code, which the Closure compiler can then do a much more aggressive property renaming and and minification so so that things can get much smaller but closure is just it's a really fine tuned tool you know it's it's used by um, most google projects and so uh, it's it's a well staffed tool with lots of history and, and really smart people working on it to to make things really small and fast yeah the the rule of thumb if you can turn on closure compiler's advanced compilation mode which requires uh, annotations to be there or for you to write your code in a very specific way, uh, you can usually get a lot more savings. And the Angular team released a tool, which I personally am very excited about, and uh, I feel like a lot of people don't know about, but it's a tool that takes TypeScript code. And when it's compiled, it turns into fully Clojure annotated code, which can be just passed to Clojure compiler with the advanced optimizations flag. And like Jeff was saying, you get this like crazy, crazy minification uh, compared to any other solution that's out today. So if you haven't checked that out, uh, definitely do a search uh, yeah, in the it's Angular called repo. T sickle. T sickle. I like. I think of it like T S tickle. That's mm -hmm. what my mind makes it. It's like tickling my code. So you, you better know, um, you better reserve that namespace before this goes live, so you can uh, <laughs> got it. And, and PM and yeah, register that one. All right. <laughs> yeah, T sickle is basically a TypeScript uh, uh, CLI wrapper, so you can run it the same way you would with TypeScript. And it's maintained by the uh, the TypeScript team on the Angular team. So I, I'm just going to uh, drive us back down the road that we were going before then. Um, so, so yeah, so you run, tree, you do some tree shaking, you do some minification. Um, why, why is that not enough? So um, Sam and I can could probably talk about lots of different reasons in practice why why those aren't enough today. Uh, I'll talk. I'll say what what I see more than anything else isn't so much the framework that's the problem it's everything else that's loaded in pages uh, so i think developers tend to think a lot about well one thing i think developers are mostly preoccupied with making things work and making features work and there's this cultural um, or this behavioral habitual thing where performance is kind of a thing that you do after you've gone to production and realize you've shipped something that's slow and users hate or search engines have a hard time crawling your application or whatever um, but in terms of like behaviors that, that I see, so people are getting better with uh, Angular with AOT. People are starting to realize that it's a significantly better uh, improvement and there are tools that can make it easier to generate smaller bundles and that kind of thing. So that's improving. It's still improving in usability and that kind of thing. But people are loading tons of scripts and style sheets and uh, what images and like way oversized images and things like this on their page uh, that in what I've seen, like the, the profiling and, and work I've done is a much bigger contribution to slowness than, than any framework code. So, so it's a great start, like minify bundle split, split your modules so that you're shipping less. But, uh, but that only gets you so far if you're, uh, if you're throwing in every kind of marketing script or, um, other jQuery library that you're not using in, into your, the head of your document and blocking your page from, from even rendering until all these load. And uh, like we're saying all these things about like slow pages, but uh, it's important to be able to measure and have an idea about like when is my page slow and when is it okay. And uh, there have been some tools that have been recently developed uh, that make this really easy to do in a very automated way. Um, and my favorite is Lighthouse, uh, which is a project out of uh, Chrome. Uh, and staffed by Paul Irish and a few other very, very smart people. Um, and what it is is a CLI tool that you can run against a web page, and it gives you a Lighthouse report, which has a score and tells you all these amazing things like, oh, you have all these script tags above um, 
your body and it's blocking first paint by this long. You have images that are massive and it's taking up this much time to download them and a bunch of other things. So uh, if you haven't checked out Lighthouse, I would definitely check it out and consider putting it in your default CI process and your default tooling stack when you're building a web page. Um, but once, once you run these tools and have an idea about what's slow, you can sort of prioritize like, sure, these images are huge, but I'm also uh, shipping all these script tags above my body, which is blocking first paint by five seconds or something crazy. Um, so like, it's important once you measure to then prioritize what's going to have biggest user facing impact. And so you tweak things and then you re-measure and you see how much impact you've actually had. Because unless you're doing this measure, fix, measure cycle, you can't actually determine if you're having a positive or negative impact. And a lot of times what you'll see people doing is cargo culting performance techniques, and they actually have uh, no impact or actual negative impact to the end users. So tools like Lighthouse can make this so much easier to get into this healthy cycle. Yeah, and I, I second that. I think that's the key thing that I'm seeing missing is performance is kind of a hard thing to quantify or measure or make it a habit. Uh, it's something that is usually reactive. Like usually developers wait until somebody says things are slow or they are digging into a problem. Uh, but Lighthouse is a great tool that you could put in your CI and, you, and it gives you scores on, on your pages, uh, on your loads. And actually, I, I know one company, um, someone in the community, that their company has a policy across the board where they have a certain score they have to be hitting in Lighthouse in order for it to pass CI. So it's actually a failure if, if you're not hitting uh, the the checklist and the, the targets from Light, Lighthouse. Um, so I think like, if, if there's one thing that people could take away from here is like, just start using this and build it into your CI process uh, if you care about performance. Um, and I think the, the other part of that is people don't know why they should care about performance or, or they assume whatever baseline performance they're getting out of the application is good enough. Um, but, but what I've been seeing lately is, or what people don't, don't think about as much is like if search engine optimization matters to your application, performance is actually a big factor in that. Uh, if you if you've got an app that is an AJAX app, as like the Google team calls them, like the crawler needs to be able to crawl your app, and they've said they have a timeout for they haven't said what the timeout is, but I would say somewhere probably between five and ten seconds, uh, where if if they don't if the page isn't done rendering by that point, they may just take a snapshot of it or may give up on rendering the page and they'll take whatever was generated by the server and try to try to figure out what the content of the page is. And that might be what gets indexed. And so I've seen sites actually where they'll have, uh, they'll have a page that gets crawled and it'll have content from a previous page still in the, the view uh, because the new page didn't load its data in time or, or whatever reason the crawler wasn't able to get the snapshot in time. Uh, so, so search engine optimization uh, matters. If if it matters to your your app, then performance is for that alone is one one thing that you should be uh, paying a lot of attention to. Yeah, I think I've heard that from more than one source that if it doesn't load, and these days load meaning not just I have all the assets, but actually finish rendering, mm -hmm. and then it'll it'll get dinged. Yeah, and it's and it's also. Yeah, dinged is another thing because they they've also said uh, that that they factor this into mobile rankings. That if your site they look at your performance and and if your site's not performing well, then they're not going to think it's a good result for mobile users. Um, and they also will will um, presumably crawl your site less frequently if if they keep going to your site and it's taking forever for them to be able to get snapshots of your your dynamic pages. And this is all public information. This is like th from from webmaster forums and things like this, where the the crawler team has has spoken up. So you mentioned putting script tags and things like this at the beginning of the page instead of the end of the page. So are you saying? And again, this is a best practice I've seen cargo culted, you know. And so I've I've been putting it at the end of the page, but I don't always see a major improvement in performance when I do that. So is it something that's critical to do, or is that something that I've just kind of picked up from the gurus that generally it's good advice? This episode is sponsored by Frontend Masters. Engineers have watched over 2 million hours of Frontend Masters videos to upgrade their skills in the latest best practices in frontend development and Node.js. Popular video courses of theirs include courses on 
Advanced JavaScript, Angular 2, React, API Design with Node, and Functional and Asynchronous JavaScript. Many of their teachers have even been guests on JavaScript Jabber. Check them out at frontendmasters.com. So is it something that's critical to do, or is that something that I've just kind of picked up from the gurus that generally it's good advice? So um, it's, it's hard to give uh, sort of general purpose performance advice without actually measuring first and sort of mm-hmm. looking at a site. Uh, the big thing is script tags above the fold are going to, uh, unless you put a defer uh, attribute on them, are going to um, cause some performance issues. You can put them below the fold and the DOM will show, but still when it hits that script tag, it's going to grab that script and when, whatever script it has, uh, it's going to try and parse that and turn it into uh, V8 code if it's Chrome. Mm-hmm. Um, and that can potentially lock up the main thread and cause a jank. So it's just really important to use Chrome Dev Tools. Um, look at some of the resources from Chrome Dev Summit specifically around how to measure and profile uh, and get into Dev Tools. Uh, record a timeline. Look at where your time is being spent when you render your page. Look at how the page paints in. Um, and then go from there. So I'm sort of against general purpose performance advice for this reason, because I say something and then a bunch of people be like, well, it doesn't actually have a big impact. It's like, well, in your specific case, it won't because this isn't your major performance hit. It's because you have, you know, 200,000 DOM nodes. That's why your page is so slow, things like that. Yeah, so that was kind of one of the questions that I have overriding this whole conversation is sometimes I feel like performance uh, is rarely, gen, you know, generic performance advice is rarely useful to me. I started doing some of the things that people say, hey, this is going to improve performance on my site. And then it's like, oh, that m- made such a marginal increase in performance. So is it, can performance really be talked about from a generic standpoint? And if so, how do people find the good generic information that's going to be helpful for them and then also be able to dig into the more customized stuff for what they're doing? Uh, so at, um, I gave a talk about this exact topic at a Palmer Dev Summit earlier this year with uh, Paul Irish and I, where we went through a bunch of these generic uh, performance advice tips and ran through and saw when they were wins and when they were losses. So uh, the thing that I stress to people is learn how to measure. Like when you learn how to measure, you can apply that to any site. And as soon as you can measure, you can then like identify performance uh, hangups and then you can address them and remeasure. So I, I would agree with you uh, that general purpose performance advice is typically not a good thing to just blindly apply to your website. Um, it's important to learn how to measure and put measurements into your CI process and into your normal workflow so that you can see when things regress or when things are getting slow. So then you can take action. And to Jeff's point, uh, not to be reactive but to be sort of in front of it before the performance issue becomes an issue yeah and that's a really good point joe i think one of the more common optimizations that is thrown around a lot is pre-rendering as being the solution to a lot of performance issues uh, which can be and for i would say for content heavy sites like for news sites or blogs and things like that pre-rendering is typically a really good optimization but uh, if you've got a CMS or dashboard or something that's completely dynamic and not something that is being deep linked to from users, pre-rendering may actually just be extra overhead you don't need. And you should focus on getting the scripts loaded and the dynamic page loaded as quickly as possible, at, uh, even if it means you have a, a blank screen for a few seconds. Um, so, yeah, it's it's really looking at how what, what's the what are the critical paths for your users and what's the you know, kind of progressively, what are the the steps we can get things rendered for them that makes sense for our application? Like, should we have content on the screen within, you know, as soon as the page is, is rendered, like let's defer all loading and, and so we can render that content and then uh, kind of asynchronously load and take over the page with our JavaScript application? Or should we just be devoting all, all the resources to quickly bootstrapping the front end application and going from there? Um, so yeah, it's, it's a matter of like you establishing what makes sense for for you, you getting the right habits in place for your application and and then figuring out which tactics make the most sense. 
that kind of like went ahead and answered probably the questions I was going to ask, which we can put in the show notes. But I posted an article that was on CSS tricks like back in 2015, but it had a lot of like these different attributes that I wasn't really aware of before reading this. Um, so I was curious unless your answer is just going to be the same, like how important is it to dig into some of these? Like there's like this DNS prefetch, uh, pre connect, prefetch, sub resource, pre render, preload. Like there's a lot of different options and these are all without having to implement any tools. Right. Uh, like native yeah. browser. Yeah. All these, all those uh, meta tags or um, sort of hints to the browser can be really, really powerful, uh, similar to H2 push and uh, link rel preload tags. But well, can you explain the H2 push? Sure, sure. Um, so H2 push is part of uh, HTTP2, which is sort of the okay. next, next version yep. of yep. Uh, HTTP. And HTTP2 lets the server push data to the client before yep. the client asks for it. And so what this lets you do is... Um, Say your page is going to request, you know for a fact that you're going to make a REST call to slash user slash info dot JSON uh, after your application has bootstrapped and you're uh, running your, your code. So if the server knows that you're going to make this request, it can say, okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and push this data to the client or the person's browser before they even ask for it. So that when they do ask for it, the data is already there and they just can take it out of the network cache and then use the data without having to go to the network and do all that work to talk to the server. Um, now, the thing with all these new techniques is in a lot of cases, the performance wins that you're going to get out of them are going to be fairly small relative to the other low hanging fruit that you have and the engineering resources required to implement them correctly and implement them so they don't actually hurt your user is quite high. So uh, I'll just go back to my previous answer and say, it's important to measure first, identify bottlenecks and address the highest uh, cost items first. And if the highest cost items for you are network utilization issues, then these are a great solution. But for 95, 98% of users, uh, these are very, very low in the prioritization queue uh, based on my measurements and based on the testing that I've done. That answers a lot of my questions. Thanks. The HTTP2 push is one of those things that as developers, we get really excited about and we say, oh, we can totally optimize this because I can, I can look at my dependencies and do some kind of webpack build or something where I can know exactly what I should push to the client and just configure my server to do it. But um, they, they can harm you in some ways. Uh, Sam was telling me that Chrome has gotten smarter about this, but um, it, it, before it was where you could HTTP2 push uh, all the dependencies for a page. And even if they had already been cached by the browser from a previous request, you would still be pushing all this data over the wire that um, that wasn't necessary. And and then uh, it could it could be blocking, or it would at least be using network resources that you shouldn't be using and draining your battery. Uh, I think Sam, you were saying that that Chrome now is smarter and will actually, if it's if a resource is already cached, it will so sometimes it will uh, cancel the push. Like it'll yeah, it'll be able to cancel it after the first frame comes in of the data. But um, so I, I actually gave a pretty in depth talk about this at Chrome Dev Summit. Uh, which you can look up where I step through the wins that you can get from H2 push and why it's hard and not easy. Um, the, the general advice that I tell people around H2 push is at best H2 push is going to save you the cost of one round trip. So if you think the request comes from the client's browser, hits the server, the server processes it and then responds. Um, H2 push when like, used in the best possible way can save you one of those round trips. And this is with a fully ideal setup. Um, so in, in situations where a round trip for you is actually pretty long, like in the order of seconds, H2 push can be a gigantic win. And that's for people that are accessing servers at very far away locations or have a real poor network uh, connection. But for most people, the cost of a round trip is 100, 200, 300 milliseconds. So um, that's the sort of sort of savings that you're looking at. Uh, there's some other permutations of this of when you have REST endpoints that are very expensive. So if generating your user.json for some reason takes five seconds, you can bootstrap that server process time 
uh, by using HT push, but um, overall the savings are not like this gigantic thing that's all, the, all of a sudden going to make your site blindingly fast. It's just another tool in your toolbox to be applied. So one of the things that I keep hearing is measure and then fix. Uh, or measure and then adjust. And, and I'm wondering, so I run Lighthouse against my application. Is it going to tell me, you should look at H2 push, or you should look at moving your script tags to the bottom of your page? Or am I just going to yes. get some uh, kind of feedback that's going to indicate to me if I have the right kind of experience that I need to do that? Nope, Lighthouse does a great job and actually provides links and resources to developers for how to improve their site. And it'll catch things like, you're using this API incorrectly, so you should use this new API, which is a lot better. So in that way, I, I absolutely love Lighthouse because it's it recommends best practices to developers. It doesn't just yell at them and say, oh, you got a 10 out of 30. No, it says, here's how you can make this score a lot better. So it's like a lot of developers I've seen on Twitter where they'll build a progressive web app, they'll run Lighthouse against it, and then they'll use the Lighthouse feedback about what's wrong on the page to actually fix up their web app to be fully compliant. And so they use it as a checklist when they're developing, which is awesome. That sounds good. I was worried I was just going to get a tool that was like, it's freaking slow, dude. <laughs> yeah, it does do that too. <laughs> oh, good to know. But in general, HTTP2, um, I think it's that, that's one of those things where across the board, if you just move from 1.1 to HTTP2, you're going to have savings. Like if nothing else, you get the, you get binary, uh, binary framing in the headers. You get um, uh, connect mul more uh, connection multiplexing. So you can, uh, you save a lot of time on, on requests because you're just reusing the connection. You're not running up against the uh, connection pool limits that you have with HTTP1 per origin. That's one thing that I've been wondering too, because I keep hearing about HTTP2. But nobody's actually said, oh, here's how you switch over to HTTP2. Yeah, most servers make it pretty seamless. Like Firebase hosting now supports it. And uh, and it's great. And they even make it, they have configuration that lets you set up push with your HTTP2 uh, as well. So we just get it for free. And it's pretty transparent or pretty opaque, whichever the right word is, uh, to the user. Like you don't really have to do anything. You, your browser just talks to the server and you're, and they both say, oh, we can do HTTP2 for this connection. And and then it just works and everything looks the same to, to you as the end user or the developer. What about Nginx or Apache? Because a lot of people are hosting on their own. Yeah, Nginx has pretty good support. Um, they, uh, I, I don't, you, you maybe know better. I, I don't remember what their push support was it may that may have just been in the enterprise version of nginx sam yeah there, there's a whole suite of uh http2 uh library implementations and how i see most people using it is they set up one of these services uh, as a front end uh, reverse proxy to their actual web server mm -hmm. and so it's, mm -hmm. it sits in between their server or nginx or whatever else and then their server so the requests will hit this uh, front end proxy and that will go ahead and multiplex out um, and it will handle things like push and uh, all the HTTP2, HTTP2 uh, protocol things. So uh, it's usually pretty straightforward for users to set up, and it's definitely 100% worth it. So one thing I've been digging into a bunch is more of like CSS loading. So since CSS is like all blocking um, with HTTP2, now everyone is saying like, you know, which we haven't talked about, but I feel like a lot of people already know this, that it's better to break up your style sheets so that since CSS is blocking, like you're not waiting for this one gargantuan thing to load. So is there anything that you guys can talk about there? Is that like something everyone should do? Yeah, uh, I can talk about this. I did a little bit of research into CSS loading. Um, and, so, and, uh, and then too, I don't, do you know anything about Houdini? I, I do, I know a little bit about Houdini. Um, Love to talk about that. Um, I am probably not the right person to go into depth about it. I just know the, the broad strokes. <laughs> uh, oh. <laughs> but but uh, the general idea with CSS being blocking uh, is an issue because if you have a style sheet in your header, uh, it's going to wait till that style sheet downloads before it paints things. Um, there have been some recent changes in Chrome where that's no longer the case, but other browsers still behave this way where it's going to block uh, the DOM from showing up because there's nothing, no styles, uh, until it's actually loaded and parsed and applied. 
So uh, you can use HTTP2 to sort of push the data and have it sitting there. Uh, and then when the style sheet goes off and makes its request, it's already there. So you get a faster uh, time to actually parse the file. But uh, the big win for most people in this case is to move the style sheets below their critical content or at the bottom of the body and then to inline their critical CSS uh, in their page. And so those two things usually gets people most of the way to having a really fast site and not have to worry about um, the CSS loading complexity. <laughs> yeah, but if my CSS is loading after the critical parts of my application, it's not going to go back and redraw those. If, if your critical CSS splitting is done correctly, uh, it won't. If it's done incorrectly, you can get that weird like flicker where it paints something, sort of paints something, and then those files load in and cause everything to flicker and repaint. Um, but if you're using uh, some of the modern tools that exist for builds, I think Webpack has one. Or Jeff, didn't you write a Webpack one to do this exact thing? I uh, Yeah, so Addy has the critical uh, tool, and I basically just wrote a Webpack wrapper around it called Webpack Plugin Critical, I think catchy name hard to figure mm -hmm. out i think that's the standard i don't know i tried to ask sean <laughs> what i should name it sean larkin but he didn't tell me so i just went with that <laughs> yeah no. and oh go ahead no oh no you go ahead and finish <laughs> sorry um you're you're right that when new css is actually applied it can cause your page to relay out and repaint um but Hopefully, the number of DOM nodes that you have on the page is not so significant that the cost of that is high. It should be very fast. Uh, if it is pretty high, then um, you can look at some other things like reducing the number of DOM nodes, reducing the CSS that's causing a reflow, et cetera, et cetera. I'll put a link in the show notes to something because, like I said, I've been digging into this a lot, but there's like resources out there to help you understand um, like which properties. You, I mean, a lot of them make sense, but which properties will cause like uh, a reflow versus repaint. And then there's some properties that don't cause either that are like pretty much safe to use mm -hmm. is my understanding. Yep, exactly. 3D transforms really fast, uh, composites it on a different layer so you don't have to affect other things. There's a lot of awesome, awesome tricks for speeding up your CSS application and also uh, moving things around in the DOM without causing everything to repaint. Uh, like when you have a spinner in the top of your page and it causes the entire page to go really slow because it causes the whole page to repaint. It's a classic issue. <laughs> um, there's, there's also one more technique for loading CSS that I just remembered. Uh, in Chrome, there's actually support for this link rel preload tag. And uh, you can use a combination of link rel preload, which is sort of like HTTP to push, except for it doesn't require HTTP to push. Uh, it sees this link rel preload. The browser says, oh, I'm going to need this file. Go off and fire off a request, get that, hold on to it. And then there's this nifty onload attribute that you can add to link rel preload tags. Um, and what onload will do is say, hey, I'm going to fire this when I have this resource ready. So you can use these link rel preload tags plus an onload attribute that calls into a function to basically lazily uh, fire off requests to load your CSS and then insert those uh, style sheets into your page when they're loaded. It's a pretty uh, awesome trick. Yeah, that's how the uh, the critical library and the Webpack plugin that I was just talking about work is they, um, they you can tell it which, like what pixel area of your screen is above the fold and should be inlined. And it'll, it'll analyze your page and your style sheets and just extract the bits of the style sheet that need to be there for the top of your page, inline those, and then it'll create a link rail preload tag to load the style sheet with an onload handler that automatically uh, sets the rel to style sheet after it's preloaded. And so then it's just treated like a normal link style sheet. Oh, that's nifty. Yeah, it's pretty neat. So one, one other thing that I'm wondering about, and this is probably going to go a little bit deeper than what we've kind of talked about so far, but what actually happens when a web page has a script tag or a link tag in it that tells it to go and pull something else off of the server? Because it seems like a lot of these uh, issues that come up are based around, okay, it pulls in the JavaScript and then it has to transpile, you know, maybe does some JIT on it, uh, you know, 
things like that. You know, the same thing with the CSS. You know, it has to translate that into actually uh, what gets painted or repainted on the web page. And I'm not 100% clear on what that process is. I'll let Sam talk about this because this is his his baby. <laughs> uh, all right, we we can go through JavaScript sort of life cycle. This is ignoring all the edge cases. We can think Fair about enough. it this way. Fair enough. Um, or the normal cases. So okay, you have a script tag. We'll pretend it has no attributes, just a source. Uh, so the browser sees that it's parsing down your page. So do you imagine the browser it gets this HTML document and starts stepping it down and saying, okay, here's an image tag, here's a div, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, look, a script tag. And oh, look, it has no defer attribute. So that means that I need to pause the browser right here. I need to go off and make this request, wait for the response. And when I have the response, I'm now going to pass it to my parser, which is the V8 parser, which is going to say, okay, go ahead and take this string of code and turn it into something that the V8 runtime can actually use. So it's going to parse and compile. And then once it's parsed and compiled, it's going to actually execute the code in there. Um, and for most people, uh, the, the actual execution phase is what's taking up most of the time. However, you'll see this interesting sort of thread that's spread across the entire internet where people are like, oh, it's weird that my Webpack bundle or my Browserify bundle uh, has all this like time. Whenever it loads, it, there's like this 300, 400 millisecond block where it's just stuck uh, at the beginning doing nothing. And just no code is executing. It just looks like it's loading the file. And what that actually is, is the parse time. So when we get this, <laughs> get this gigantic string, the browser is like, oh, I guess I need to parse all these different paths uh, for for this code. And that actually ends up taking a lot of time, especially with these monolithic bundles that Webpack generates and, and Browserify gen generates. See, but, I told you he doesn't like tools. <laughs> no, no, no it, it, it's fine. This time can be small if you're not shipping a lot of code. But a lot of people ship like everything and multiple copies of everything unknowingly. So... Uh, yeah, so once the code uh, parse, compiles, and executes, uh, it's basically done. And that's the life cycle of a script. And then your, your page can continue uh, parsing. So the fact that the page actually stops parsing when it hits one of these script tags is a little unknown to most people, but um, it can cause some significant performance issues, especially if you have your script tags intermixed inside of your body, because like the page can half, half parse, and then it'll sort of paint something weird. And then all of a sudden it will like flicker and then paint the rest. And that's because of those script tags. Does it do the same thing with CSS? Uh, CSS behavior is different depending on browsers. Okay. Can you just talk about the Houdini stuff really quick before we go further since we brought that up and I used a word and people might not know what it is. What word was that? Sorry. The, the Houdini, like the new, I guess it's like a new task force. You are going to work on the CS, like how the browser parses CSS? Yeah. Um, my understanding of Houdini is that the Chrome team is looking into ways to expose the CSS parser, I think. Uh, well, it's like more APIs so that we'll have access to like different things in the critical rendering path. It was my yeah. understanding. Yeah, it just exposes these more primitives inside of the CSS engine uh, to users, so you have more control. That's that's my broad stroke understanding of it. I'll put a link in the show notes to this article. I thought it was pretty cool. One thing you mentioned, Sam, was uh, how people bundle things into their bundles and don't even realize it. Um, and I think even if they do realize it, sometimes they don't realize the cost or the size of things that, that are in their bundles. Uh, one cool tool that a lot of people have have discovered recently and, and I find really helpful in showing people exactly how, how much they're paying for different modules to be in their bundle is Source Map Explorer. This is a really simple CLI tool that you can get from NPM. And uh, you, you uh, build something with Webpack or whatever, something that generates a minified bundle and a source map. And then you just run uh, this tool against it and it'll open a page in your web browser that visually lays out how big different modules are inside of your bundle. 
Uh, one thing we find with this is, is people find out their, like with Angular, we use RxJS, the observable library, and people will find out they're accidentally importing the entire library with all combinators from RxJS if they if they have the wrong import path somewhere. Uh, so they'll be importing all these things they're not even using, and, they'll, and Source Map Explorer will show them that this is taking up you know, a couple hundred kilobytes of, of your bundle or something, and and then you can fix it, you fix your imports, and then you can see run source map explore again and see how much smaller uh, it, the footprint of those particular modules are. Another another big one is Moment, uh, the the JavaScript library. With it, it, it tends to by default, if you just with Webpack or bundling it up, it'll include a huge JSON file with a bunch of localization and things like that, which. Uh, it's, I think it's hundreds of meg, uh, not megabytes, hundreds of kilobytes in the bundle, and uh, so there are ways. Then people can realize that there are ways to uh, trim that down to just the locales you need, and and significantly shave that down. So Source Map Explorer is a really handy tool for that. Yeah, and there's there's also um, a Webpack bundle analyzer, which gives you a tree map visualization of the files and their dependency structures which I like. Um, and if you're not using Webpack uh, and you're using Polymer, I actually wrote a library that does something very similar. Um, it's just like Web Component Bundle Analyzer. So it uses your uh, Web Component Dependency Graph to build a tree map as well. And so you can explore where all your size is coming from. And there's a bunch of other tools that are popping up. So uh, again, another tool in your toolbox mm -hmm. to understand where the size of your JavaScript is coming from and why your JavaScript file is, you know, 1.3 megabytes or something crazy. So what well was, said. <laughs> <laughs> you check. You got a question? Yeah, I'm don't, wondering. Don't so what what seem to be the the things that people most commonly mess up? I mean, we've talked a lot about the tools and some of the solutions and some of the things that people do. But but what would you say is the thing you see most commonly done that causes a performance issue like this? Not measuring. That's the number one issue. <laughs> as soon as you measure, like uh, there's been a few Twitter threads over the last couple of days where people are like, yeah, I got my uh, Webpack bundle or my Webpack bundles at 800K. And I asked them, can I see your your tree map? Can you show me the source map explorer or whatever of what you're shipping? And like within 20 minutes of them sending that over, they're able to usually cut it by 20, 40, 50% even just by looking at that. So like if people were to start measuring and start measuring on devices that their users actually use day to day under the similar network conditions, they would experience the pain that their users experience and they would be motivated to fix it. And so that's the biggest mistake is simply not measuring. One other thing that I'm thinking about here though is that a lot of these are command line tools that you would install with NPM and my iPhone doesn't have NPM on it. So is there a tool that I can actually use to measure this on a mobile device? Uh, on Android, oh yeah, on Android you can actually run Lighthouse against your phone uh, using ADB, and there's instructions in the repo. Um, iPhone is a little bit trickier to measure to get like performance metrics out of though. Um, Web page test is a good one. Uh, they have a bunch of devices that you can choose to run their tests over, and I use their tool a lot. They also have a a really great 3G network emulator that. Uh, does an amazing job of simulating what network is like on one of these poor networks for your users. Yeah, web page test is a great tool, and I think it's underutilized in the community. Uh, but that's usually one of the first things. If I if somebody comes to me and has a performance issue and they want us to take a look at it, the first thing I'll do is run web page test, and I'll do it. And you can do it where you can run it with a real mobile device. Um, and with with the emulated network, which is pretty pretty good emulation, and then you can just show them, and it has the, it has um, you know waterfall network waterfall, and will give you lots of metrics around load time and interactive time and really good depth, so you can just show that and and people then kind of visually see like how how mobile users are experiencing their their site. Anything else that we should dive into here before we head into picks? I think for me, the biggest thing that that I want to help make better in the community and 
you know, help with tooling and, and whatever we can is, is developing better habits around performance. Like Sam was saying, once people measure, or if it's part of their, their process, if it's part of their, their CI process or, or their software life cycle, however, they're organizing their projects. Um, I think this all gets a lot better. I mean, we could talk about tools and techniques and things all day, but, but we really have to focus on who's taking ownership of this and when are they thinking about it and helping to shift that more towards the, the development time instead of the, uh, let's wait until the app is done and, and somebody complains about it. Um, so, so even just adding lighthouse to your CI build, I think is the, is if we had one thing that people could take away is, is, uh, one thing they could do right now. Let's take a break from this episode and really quickly talk about finding a job. You know, searching for a job can feel stressful, scary, and time consuming. Pushy recruiters try to sell you on roles you don't actually want. And the job boards make you feel like you're throwing your resume into a black hole, never to be seen again. And sometimes you go all the way through an interview process just to find out that the very end that the salary offer or company culture doesn't match what you're looking for. Well, there's a solution. Hired.com is the world's most intelligent talent matching platform for full-time and contract opportunities. They make the job search faster, focused, and stress-free instead of endlessly applying to companies and hoping for the best. Hired puts you in control of how and when you connect with compelling opportunities. And after completing one simple application, top employers apply to you. And the best part is, is that you get money. That's right. They pay you if you get a job through them. Listeners to this show can earn double their normal hiring bonus by signing up with the show's link. That's right. You get $2,000 instead of $1,000. So go sign up at hired.com slash JavaScript Jabber. All right. Well, let's go ahead and do some picks. Amy, do you have some picks for us? Oh, my God. I thought you were going to pick me first. I'm not totally ready, but uh, I'll go for it. Um, so I'm, I have, like, a ton piled up, and I was trying to curate them so I don't give them away all at once. Uh, the first one is another podcast that I'm going to pick again, um, a specific episode that I really liked. But it's a change log, and it was with Sandy Metz. Uh, it was called 99 Practical Models of OOP. Um, so, you know, I know in JavaScript land, we're like all functional right now. But I just think there's so much wisdom in everything that she says. So uh, anything that she says, I would love to listen to it, even if it's not, even if it is about object-oriented programming. <laughs> Anyways, um, and then I'll do another one that's a little bit more fun. This is a Twitter account that was posted in a Slack channel at work. Uh, it's just uh, Emergency Kittens. But I believe emergency is spelled a little bit differently, so uh, you'll have to look in the show notes for a link to that. But um, that will be my non-technical pick. And I will leave it at that for this week. I got lots more to come, though. Super cool. We've had Sandy Metz on Ruby Rogues before, so I'll put I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Um, Joe, what are your picks? Well, I'm I'm trying to get a concept for this emergency kittens. <laughs> okay. coming. The link is coming. Wait for it. Well, I I googled and looked at a couple of links, like. Is this like, I've got a kitten emergency, or is it like, hey, ship me a kitten quick? Like emergency cuteness. Emergency, okay. So this is like, oh my gosh, I'm having a rough day. I need some cuteness. Where are some kittens? This, that's what this is for, right? Because there's there's a Twitter account. There's a website. It's coming. It's coming. Hold on. This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I will admit that I've felt that way, and for me, it's baby, it, baby chihuahuas, chihuahua puppies. But... <laughs> <laughs> of course, we should have counted on a cat pick from Amy. I haven't had any in a really long time. Yeah, you're falling behind. All right, so <laughs> <laughs> I've got a ton of picks. I spent the weekend at a board game convention in central Utah, central kind of southern Utah, Bryce Canyon National Park at a hotel surrounded by snow playing board games all weekend with friends and my kids and stuff had an absolute blast and man, I played a bunch of new board games, so I couldn't pick them all possibly. So I'm going to pick the conference itself, their convention itself, Bryce con. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes, come out, come to Utah in next January in a year in the middle of winter 
to one of our beautiful national parks and spent a weekend playing board games. It's totally awesome. And then the board game that I had the most fun with is a game called Clank, where you play, it's a board game where you're each uh, going, it's like uh, you're playing The Hobbit, right? You're going into the dungeons, the dragon's lair, trying to get some uh, relic and make it out alive. And it's it's a really fun game. And the clank is the noise that you make, right? So the more things that you do that make noise, that make noise the more clank you cause, then the dragon will attack. And it's, it's a really fun game. So that's my pick is the board game Clank and uh, Bryce Con board game convention. Very cool. Um, I'm going to jump in here with a few picks as well. Um, so last week, um, I, I had a little bit of a, a family emergency, and so um, I was going to talk a little bit about CES, uh, since I was at CES the week before last. Um, one of the things that I picked up there, and I probably picked this on one of the MyJS Story episodes, um, is uh, this GoPuck um, battery pack. And it comes with a clip that's impossible to describe without showing it to you. So just take it from me that it comes with a really awesome clip that allows you to put it on a backpack strap or uh, a belt or something like that, and it's super nice. Um, it charged up my uh, iPhone uh, pretty much for a day and a half to two days, um, just leaving it plugged into my iPhone the whole time. And I was doing periscopes and walking around and listening to podcasts as I was browsing stuff and things like that. So um, anyway... Uh, great stuff there. Um, there were a lot of really cool stuff things at um, CES. So if you're interested at all in some of the things that I ran into or saw there, um, head over to my YouTube channel or devchat.tv's YouTube channel. And uh, I probably have 10 to 15 videos that uh, I'm going to be posting over the next week, which means they'll be out by the time this goes live. Um, just showing off some of the things that I saw there. Um, there were robotics and drones and VR uh, stuff, lots of fun stuff. Um, there were kids programming systems. There were probably a handful of those that I looked at. So anyway, um, really, really cool stuff. Um, and I'm definitely looking forward to going next year. So yeah, those are my picks. Um, Jeff, what are your picks? Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention my new company, Narwhal. Uh, that uh, Victor Savkin from the Angular team and myself just started. We're working with big teams, working on big projects, uh, multiple projects. Really, we're, we're trying to solve a lot of the difficult problems that come with many Angular applications for you know critical projects uh, for, for larger companies. And uh, we just started this in December, and we've already you know, been working with lots of folks and doing lots of exciting things. So check it out at nrwl.io and also our blog is blog.nrwl.io which has lots of cool um, in-depth angular articles all right sam do you have some picks i do i have one really really good pick i'm so excited about um i've been playing around with this uh thing called pico 8 which is um, a fantasy console for making programs so it's basically a like a 16-bit uh, fake imaginary console that you program some subset of Lua in, and there's a whole sprite editor and uh, a runtime just baked into this program. And so it's really fun. I've been playing around with it a bunch, uh, making games and making stuff that looks really cool. So check it out, Pyco 8. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll go ahead and start wrapping this up. If people want to follow you guys, see what you're doing, things like that, um, where do they go? We'll start with you, Jeff. Yeah, the best place is Twitter. And my handle is Jeff B. Cross. Everyone forgets the B. So I don't know who the guy is who has Jeff Cross, but that's not me. I look for Jeff B. Cross. All right. And how about you, Sam? Uh, best place again is on Twitter. I find me at S A M C C O N E. I have a red hat over my face, so it's really easy to tell. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap this show up. Thank you both for coming. This was really fun and really interesting to talk through. Yeah. Thanks for having us. All right. Thanks. We will catch.